Today on the Circular Economy Show. Food manufacturers, so our favorite brands and retailers, so supermarkets that we go to to get our groceries, they have this massive opportunity. They have the power to make nature positive food the norm. And you get a, a line of three cheeses one is a, a walnut cheese, one is uh, a classical dairy comté, and the last one is a blend of uh, walnut milk and dairy milk. Welcome to the Circular Economy Show. Did you know that your food is designed? And it can be designed in a way that rebuilds biodiversity, tackles climate change, and delivers better outcomes for farmers and the end consumers. Those are the headlines of the Ellen McCarr Foundation's latest study, The Big Food Redesign. I'm going to be joined by two people from the Foundation's food initiative team, Emma Chow and Gail Le Gallard, to talk about this issue, how that can happen, and some of the visions of this new future for food. Okay, Gail, Emma, thanks so much for joining us on the Circle Economy show. Emma, I wanted to start with you. Why food? Why is food such an important topic for us to explore here at the Emma McCarthy Foundation? Well, Sab, if we're gearing towards transforming the entire economy, it's impossible not to look at food because food is a massive sector and it's not going anywhere. Food is imperative in our lives. We rely on it to survive. And with a glo growing global population, it's actually a growing industry. And today, unfortunately, because of the linearity of our food system, it's contributing to our biggest global challenges that we're facing. So it's the primary driver of biodiversity loss, and it accounts for about a third of annual greenhouse gas emissions. But it doesn't need to be this way, and we can actually apply the principles of circular economy to reimagine the food system so that it's regenerative by design. So that's really why we're looking at food. Um, you know, as, uh, I think there's a famous saying um, that food is kind of the mother of all systems. And we talk about system change. You know, we've all got to eat, obviously. We're all engaging with food in everyday lives. There are many aspects of it from the way it's grown to the people involved, to how it's sold, um, to what happens after um, we've consumed it or not consumed it. How, you know, you've been at the foundation for several years now. This is, um, you know, the, our food initiative has been alive for a while. What is the, what's been the kind of journey for Ellen McCarr Foundation and for you in terms of trying to get our heads around what role the circle has to play in redesigning our food system? So yeah, you're just highlighting how food truly is entangled in everything. It's super complex. It touches all of the sustainable development goals. And it was when I joined the foundation in 2018 that I joined the initial team that started to investigate what would actually mean to apply circular economy principles to our food system. And therefore, what sort of system solutions can we bring to the table? And does the Ellen McGarth Foundation be a part of the transformation that's needed? So what we have seen all along is there is a big opportunity to apply the principles of circular economy, to go from a mindset and approach of trying to undo the damage of today's linear food system to actually redesigning it to be something completely different, something much, much better, where we can actually be driving absolute positive benefits for people, for business, and for nature now and long term. So we were first investigating, and we had this hypothesis that cities as centers of consumption, where about 80% of the world's food is expected to be eaten in 2050, have a big role to play. And the findings of our research during that initial year were published in our first report, our first deep dive on food, which is called Cities and the Circular Economy. And that was published in January of 2019 and really gave way to the launch of what we now call the Food Initiative in June of 2019. So we've been working with London, Sao Paulo, New York to support demonstration of circular economy for food in those cities and their strategic partners 
of the foundation. And that journey continues with them. And then about a year ago, we started to sense that there was um, a big opportunity that we could start to tap into looking more at the industry side and looking at something that we call food design. I know we'll have a chance to unpack today, but really thinking about food manufacturers and retailers in particular. Like cities, they have huge demand power because they source a lot of food, therefore influence a lot of land, and create so many of the food offerings that we eat every day around the world. So is there something that we could develop as the foundation in terms of an approach for how these sort of businesses can rethink their food so that it has the best positive outcomes for biodiversity, for climate, for farmers, for people, and ultimately for their business? And um, something you hear upon there is very often we talk about food um, in this context. We talk about the challenges, right? We talk about statistics like a third of all food is wasted across the value chain. Um, at the same time, there are many people in the world, of course, who suffer from malnutrition, their health uh, costs and negative effects from um, other nutrition problems in, in more developed parts of the world. Um, our angle has always been on What's the solution to this? And that's kind of the circle we frame. What if, our f- what if our food could help to actually rebuild biodiversity? What if our food could be part of the solution to climate change? And what does a transformation of the economy, a transformation of the system look like? Uh, as of, on the date of airing this episode, we are um, publishing a new paper, a new, new publication along the lines of what you described. What's the kind of synopsis or brief, you know, the brief findings of that research? Yes, so we have this new study, new publication that's now available um, called The Big Food Redesign, Regenerating Nature with the Circular Economy. And essentially the headlines are that food manufacturers, so our favorite brands and retailers, so supermarkets that we go to to get our groceries, they have this massive opportunity. They have the power to make nature-positive food the norm. So imagine if you could go to the grocery store and every choice that you're faced with actually is nature positive by design. And that's the amazing thing about food is it's from nature, which inherently is regenerative. So it can be, as you're saying, actively building biodiversity and tackling climate change. And so this study provides a new design-led approach for these businesses to realize this opportunity and demonstrates that it's possible. And so it's all about going beyond better sourcing of today's current ingredients because we need to diversify big time. That's just inherent to shifting to a regenerative production model where we have much greater diversity of what's produced in a given area of land. Today, about four, well, exactly four crops provide about 60% of the world's calories. So that just shows how concentrated it is today. And we need to go well beyond just better sourcing of those few ingredients to rethink what ingredients we're using altogether and how they're produced. So that's really linking with the um, design piece of things. And if we rethink our ingredients and how they're produced, we can provide better choices for customers, better choices for, well, they're better for farmers as well, and better for climate and biodiversity. And so we looked at potatoes, wheat and dairy in the EU and UK to do some analysis to get the quantitative evidence to back up these more conceptual um, design opportunities. Having to say the EU and the UK is so irritating, isn't it? It was much easier when we could just say the (laughs) EU. Just before I bring Gail in, um, there's, uh, there's, you know, what you're saying that because uh, very often the when people hear about the problems in the food system, um, they're where they go to in the mindset wise is what can I buy that is better than than I don't know the mainstream. What you described there is a vision where there's in some way there's only good choices on the supermarket shelf. It's it's it goes beyond just individuals having to make these very difficult complex decisions all by themselves. Yeah, that's that's the ultimate goal. And that's what's really interesting, looking at those ingredients that I just mentioned. Um, you know, it's not just about doing this because for business to do this because it's good for nature and society more broadly, but actually we found that 
um, doing circular design for food and applying those approaches can not only reduce biodiversity loss by about 50% and um, greenhouse gas emissions by about 70%, but also increase total food output by about 50% and increase farmer profitability per hectare by about 3,100 US dollars each harvest or year in the case of dairy. So it's just showing that um, this is this makes sense across the board. And because of that, we hope that we can realize a future, which you just described, where the default choice just always is a good choice. Like there's no there's no bad choices. That would be the the ultimate vision that we're trying to work towards here. And um, Gail, to bring you into this uh, conversation, what, Emma used a word a lot in, in that brief chat we had, design in relation to food. And most many of our viewers may not really think about our food as being designed, right? So is our food designed? Yes, yes, it is, Deb, actually. Uh, just like the clothes you're wearing now and just like the, the chair you're sitting on, our food, the food we eat has been designed. In fact, um, food products are the result of a number of decisions about you know, how we will taste, how it will look, how good it is for us, and, and quite importantly, how it will impact nature. So if I take an example of like a biscuit I love from my childhood in France called Petit Écolier, it has like a little biscuit draped in chocolate. Uh, and if I think about this, a brand manager has created the concept. A food scientist has come up with a recipe, a buyer has sourced the ingredient from specific suppliers, and a retailer has chosen the shelf where my parents decided to buy it. So yes, all these are design decisions. And and one of the one of the things I find interesting about that is that many of these kind of this sort of act of food design, it's not necessarily something that's been happening forever. Some of the big drastic changes in our food system, um, you know, I, I read a book recently that I told Emma about and she was like, oh, you know, said we've been doing loads of work on this already. It was amazing to me, but it was called the Dorito effect. And it was about how kind of flavor is being applied to food. It's actually quite recent technology in the history of food. And so in many ways, being able to think about our food as being designed is something we've done quite recently in terms of shifting our food system. What role does um, circular economy or circular design play in redesigning our food? Yeah, I think that's, that's where it becomes very interesting, uh, that if we want to create positive consumer, economic, farmer, environmental outcomes, you can combine food design with the principles of circular economy, and that is circular design for food. And what it's about is it's about rethinking product concepts, rethinking the ingredient selection, the sourcing, packaging, so that we can create products that are nature positive. And what we found in this study is that if we combine four opportunities around ingredient selection and sourcing, that can unlock amazing benefits when it comes to the environment, economics, and yield. And these four opportunities are using diverse, lower impact, upcycled, and regeneratively produced ingredients. And um, there's something uh, sort of, we, we've talked a bit about food design and circles on food. I guess the that when you mentioned those four um, kind of opportunities, there's something intuitive to me that, you know, I can think of examples of upcycled ingredients that already exist in the system that might show what's kind of possible. It feels like there's something about the combination of those things that is crucial here. It's a redesign, a transformation of the system beyond kind of just individual decisions. Is that right? Am I kind of hitting on the right note there? Yeah, exactly. I think each of these opportunities have amazing benefits in itself. So, for example, diverse ingredients, you know, we all know that biodiversity, genetic diversity is very important. And we need more, as, as Emma was mentioning, we only 60% of our calories come from four crops. And there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of crops available out there. So there's a huge opportunity for businesses to incorporate a much broader range of ingredients in their products. Uh, so, for example, like we're using a lot of sugar cane and sugar beets to produce sugar, but there's also date coconut, monk fruit, stevia, there are many options that we could use for sweetener or, you know, how exciting would it be to try new varieties of potatoes or perennial wheat. Uh, and all of these diversity brings a lot of resilience to the food system. 
So if there are shocks like drought or pests, um, with biodiversity, we're going to be able to reach a higher level of resilience. Um, if I go to... Oh, yeah, go for it. No, no, please carry on. <laughs> the... Um, so another benefit, so if you go to the, the second opportunity, which is lower impact ingredients, so it's inherently saying that some ingredients have the potential to have um, a lower environmental impact than others. Uh, and, you know, a lot of businesses are already exploring the opportunity, for example, of switching from um, conventionally produced animal proteins to plant proteins. And what we see in the study is that the this opportunity extends um, well beyond diversifying protein source. For example, if we if we want to replace conventional wheat flour with pea flour uh, in a box of breakfast cereals, we can reduce farm level greenhouse emission, greenhouse gas emissions by 40% and farm level biodiversity loss by 5%. So, so each of these um, opportunities have amazing benefits. Uh, but as you said, they are they are the best when combined all together. So they they reach the the best level of um, yields of economics uh, when businesses start redesigning their product portfolio and looking at all of these four opportunities at the same time and thinking, how can I combine those to create products that are good for people and good for nature? What I was going to jump in um, with back then was when you were describing the kind of diversity of ingredients, that's when it kind of starts to sound like kind of quite an exciting innovation opportunity. And that's where the word design feels quite powerful because, it, you know, we we begin to imagine the possibilities of the alternative or the vision for something different. One thing that we, we talk about in this idea of design, it does kind of imply that there are designers in the food system. I don't feel I've ever met anyone who's, I mean, you're, you're a designer by background, Gail, but I've never ever met anyone who's described themselves as a food designer. Are there more people who should be thinking about themselves as designers in our food system? Yeah, definitely. I think there are very few people that call themselves food designers. Um, but I think if we, if we think of um, food design as the series of decision that impacts how product will look, how it will taste, etc. Then we have a lot of designers in in food companies, in FMCGs, and retailers, but also chefs could be considered as food designers. So you know, um, the brand managers that decide on the concept as a food designer, the food scientists that creates the recipes and carefully choose uh, the ingredients is, is a designer. To a buyer that then is going to go and try to find the best suppliers for these ingredients is also for designers. So there are many people that could consider themselves as uh, designers, which is quite exciting. And um, we did a bit of kind of food design as part of this, um, you know, hypothetical food design as part of this research and paper. In the in the uh, PDF that people can download off our website, there are these kind of food products of the future I wonder if you could just say briefly, you know, why did we do that? Like, I mean, I guess, is that because there just aren't necessarily these uh, nature positive solutions, you know, pr proliferating the market already? And what and what are they? <laughs> yeah, so we, we kept on asking ourselves uh, and having those questions quite close to our mind, like what if our food could build uh, biodiversity? What if our food could tackle climate change? What would it look like? And then one day we decided, you know, let's just, Let's just invent it. Let's see how it would look like. So, so we we created uh, four products, uh, and we're thinking, okay, if FMCGs and retailers followed our recommendations and applied circular design for food for their food products, what could those products be? Uh, and by 2030, could we find them on the shelves? And we developed four four of them. Uh, one is a line of cheeses. So we have three cheeses that have been grown on a silver pasture. So silver pasture is when um, cows are grazing around trees uh, that then, so in this case, the trees are walnut trees and uh, the farmer can make milk out from the cows and from the, um, the walnuts. Uh, then you get a, a line of three cheeses. One is a, a walnut cheese. One is uh, a classical dairy conte. And the last one is a blend of uh, walnut milk and dairy milk. Uh, I wish I could taste it, and I hope I will be able to it's taste it. It's an example, it right, of just using as much of the food that's created from this hypothetical, hypothetical farm as possible, right? Using all of 
the value that is being generated by this amazing farming technique? Yeah, exactly. Well, like one of the central ideas of this report is saying instead of um, instead of bending nature to create food products, we can uh, design our food so that nature thrives. Uh, and that's exactly what we've been trying to illustrate with those products. So a second one is a set of cereals uh, made for from intercropped wheat and peas, because peas have this amazing ability to fixate nitrogen in the soil that we wheat needs to grow. Um, and so we have yeah, a cereal bar, a box of cereal, uh, two boxes of cereals that are made of, um, the, it's the same proportion of wheat and peas on the field and in the cereals. So we are taking all the output from that farm and transforming it into uh, the cereal. Very good. And what, 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 other, what other products do we have that uh, we're envisioning in the future? So I've got my cereal, I've got my cheese, what, yes. what else am I missing? Uh, you're missing potatoes, aren't you? <laughs> uh, so we were uh, imagining. So what what could uh, what could different var- varieties of potatoes look like? You know what 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 are the kind of potatoes we would want to see in the supermarkets in the future? And and we found some really interesting, uh, more resilient, more yielding uh, potato varieties that today uh, are not sold in supermarkets, and we call them down to earth. And then the last ones are delicious cookies that are entirely made from upcycled ingredients. So you have upcycled flowers, uh, upcycled sweetener from different sources, from coffee cherry. You have um, the flour that is made from, you know, when you make oat milk or when you make plant-based milk, you get you get a pulp that you can transform into flour. So each of the ingredients of these cookies are made from um, upcycled byproducts. I was going to say that I was missing um, dessert, but you've uh, you've thought of that. So each of these kind of <laughs> visionary uh, products are exemplifying the kind of four strategies that we um, that we diagnosed earlier. To bring you back in, Emma. I mean, I guess in future episodes of the show, we're going to you know we talk about in the the report the actors who are needed to make it happen, and especially the. Uh, fast moving because it were the brands and the retailers who kind of sit at the heart of the design of this system. Um, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about, you know, what are what are the big barriers or challenges to making this happen? Because I guess we've painted a nice picture in some ways of the opportunities of it. Of course, it doesn't mean it's easy to do. Yeah, so we lay out five actions in the study for these food brands and retailers to make these amazing iconic products that Gal just showed us a reality, right? Because that's what we want to work towards. Um, And a couple, if I can just highlight one of them, which hopefully has come through is quite a crucial one is, is, as you were highlighting earlier, Sab, is it's like a completely new way of a mindset of approaching how we're sourcing ingredients and what we're, how we're making the most of the land that we're tending to. And that's why we see the great benefits, especially when it comes to biodiversity and climate, um, because you're actually making the most of what can be produced. So rather than just using, for instance, clover as an intercrop or cover crop with, say, wheat, which also fixates nitrogen to the soil and is great, we what if we actually planted um, peas? And so that's why we designed that cereal to be using wheat and peas in combination. To do that, these businesses need to create a new collaborative dynamic with farmers. There needs to be designing these products for nature, but with farmers, because it's a dialogue around, okay, you're here today, let's say in a conventional wheat plot. What does it actually need based on the conditions of the land? Because regenerative production, very importantly, is all about mindset and approach rather than mechanical here's your prescription, because you're in a completely different relationship with the place and land. So it's about what does the future, let's say 10 years from now, what does that actually look like in this place based on conditions? And therefore, what do you start planting today or what livestock do you integrate? And then me as a buyer, what are my future options in terms of what ingredients will be produced? And therefore, how does that impact my design strategies, not just for a single product or product line, but we're, we're looking at entire um, portfolio redesign. So taking this notion 
of an opportunity is a circular design for food and running that through the whole portfolio. So that's another one of our um, action areas that we lay out in the study is around creating um, well-resourced and ambitious action plans to really get this embedded because we see more and more companies making commitments and putting good energy and investment into things like regenerative agriculture. Um, however, there's still room to go in terms of creating really well thought through and resource strategies to roll that out across the board. Um, and one other very important area, if I can highlight, is around policy, which we haven't spoken about yet. But of course, there's great opportunity for policymakers through their um, allocation of, of subsidies, where there's a vast amount of resources that goes to farmers each year to further support regenerative production, um, but also areas where there's lots of innovation needed, things like upcycled ingredients. We don't see solutions really at scale today. So thinking about those public dollars that are dedicated to um, R&D and innovation programs, what if we started to orient that to things like upcycling innovations that all of industry can benefit from. Um, so there's there's lots of different ways that policymakers can help set a playing field that allows, allows us to move to this positive vision as quickly as possible. I mean, I love that you said it starts with mindset, because even hearing you describe the relationship between that product and kind of working with nature on that farm level kind of highlights how it's a, just a different way of thinking about these, this huge topic, um, and you know, you can imagine the, the mindset that really is attached to the linear economy is kind of extracting as much as possible at each point in this supply chain. Well, what you're describing is really more of a collaborative ecosystem approach where we're regenerating and building value almost at every point in the chain. Um, Emma and Gail, thanks so much for joining us on the Circle Economy Show, and uh, we'll be sure to direct people to download that paper. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Next week on the Circular Economy Show, we're going to be engaging with some of the key stakeholders who are needed to make this big food redesign happen. We'll be cooking with regenerative ingredients, talking to big business, and much more. So don't miss that episode. As a reminder, the Circular Economy Show is brought to you by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we develop and promote the idea of a circular economy, engage key stakeholders on the topic, and mobilize system solutions at scale, just as we do with our food initiative, which we've been talking about today. Do subscribe to YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook to get notified every single time we go live, and we'll see you next week on the Circular Economy Show. <laughs>